So, uh, let's see. Well, uh, hello everyone. So today, uh, today we're glad to have uh, Dr. Uh, Emil Okada from University of Oxford. So he'll give a talk on uh, the wheel front side of representation theater groups. Please. Thank you everyone, for, for inviting me and, and thank you everyone for, for coming to the talk. Um, so yeah, so like Bayeng said, I'll be talking about the wavefront sets for, of representations of piadic groups. Um, and then I want to in particular focus on its relation with local Langlands correspondence. Um, but before we get into the details, I'd like to, to motivate why one might care about the wavefront set as an invariant. And the, um, the motivation comes from automorphic forms. Um, uh, so, so we consider a reductive group defined and split over some number field. And then if you have some automorphic representation, you can decompose it as a restricted tensor product of, of local factors, where the restriction is that all but finitely many of the, the local factors are spherical or unramified, depending on your, your terminology. And so there's, there's this invariant one can attach to, to representations of um, automorphic, uh, sorry, of, of G and um, in general, you can also attach it to representations of piadic groups and Lie groups and finite groups of Lie type. The sort of common characteristic is that you should always think of it as a collection of nil potent orbits over the algebraic closure of the base field. Um, so it's not too important exactly how it's defined in our case. You just need to know that you can attach it to an automorphic representation. And in the automorphic case, it's defined in terms of degenerate Whitaker Fourier coefficients. Um, and the reason why this invariant is, is worthwhile studying is because there's a non-trivial non interplay between the wavefront set of the automorphic representation and the wavefront set of the local factors. So you have this bound below by the, the wavefront set of the automorphic representation for the wavefront set of all the local factors. And I include quotes here because these are nil potent orbits over um, uh, different base fields, but the, the thing to keep in mind is if you have a particular root datum, then as long as the characteristic of the base field is large enough, the partially ordered set of the nil point orbits really doesn't matter, doesn't depend on the base field. So you can transfer it all over to C. And this is sort of where this comparison makes sense. Um, some of the implications of this is if you know that the, the wavefront set of the automorphic representation is large, this gives you structural constraints on the local factors. And conversely, if you're interested in the degenerate Whitaker Fourier coefficients, then no knowledge about the local factors will give you upper bounds for, for the wavefront set there. So that's that's the that's the um, motivation for one might care about it. So my talk in particular will focus about focus on the wavefront set for the um, piadic case. So before we start, I'm going to introduce some notation because when, when you say local factors, you mean the local wavefront stuff, right? Or yeah, so this is the wavefront set of the okay, local. Yeah. Okay. Oh, to, uh, I, I have questions. So in the case of like uh, uh, modular form or something classical stuff, is that, is that uh, what what is the wavefront front set uh, more precisely? Yeah, Sorry, one more time. Uh, so suppose the pi come from like classical modular form of GL2. Uh, uh -huh. Is that the more precise meaning of the, the wave front set for the modular um, form? So I'm not an expert on the, the automorphic side, so it's more motivation, but maybe buying uh, does work quite extensively with this. I don't know if you... Can yeah, for me. GL2, you see, because they're just two orbits. So zero orbits and non-trivial orbits. So as long as the form is non-zero, uh, it's a generic. I mean, you can take the Fourier expansion on the on the Fourier. Is it just Fourier expansion? Yeah, Fourier expansion. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So oh, here, okay. the the wavefront set is kind of a, a crude form of the Fourier expansion. Oh, okay. I mean, for GLN, everything is cos forms are generic, so there is only one orbit that matters in a way. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. So yeah. Okay, that's the key point. Okay. So the fuller. Okay. Mm. Is it possible to say um, something about unramified representations? Like, is it simple to define to define what WF is or calculate what it is? Um, well, so 
we'll do an example calculation in the talk for an unratified representation, but in general, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I hope that answers it. Um, so, but yeah, so continuing where I, I left off. So I'm gonna focus on the, the piadic case. Um, so in our setting, we're gonna let K be a finite extension of the piadic numbers. We're gonna fix some algebraic closure K by. Inside there, we're gonna fix, or we're gonna take the maximal and ramified extension of, of little K. And the main thing to keep in mind is that the residue field of the maximal and ramified extension is an algebraic closure for the residue field for little k. So that will play an important role. And um, we'll be interested in nil point orbits over the various fields that you see here. So we're gonna have some scheme defined over little k. We're gonna be interested in the little k points, capital K points, k bar points. And nil point orbits are just orbits by the adjoint action on the nil point elements of, of the Lie algebra. So. We'll call these either K rational or P adic orbits, these unramified or capital K rational orbits, and these we call geometric orbits. Um, and in general, we'll have TypeScript fonts for P adic things, calligraphic fonts for unramified things, and boldface fonts for schematic objects, so they're geometric points. So it's a notation heavy talk, so I find it helpful to get this out of the way at the start, but I'll come back to this picture to remind you of the various notations um, when it comes up. Okay, so I've given you sort of the general motivation and overview for why you care about the wavefront set. So I'll give you the actual definition in the piadic case. Um, so we're starting with some piadic group. Uh, so we have some reductive group defined over K. And we consider the K points. Um, and it's defined for admissible representation. You can ignore the irreducible. I was supposed to move that. Um, and the way it's defined is in terms of this so-called Harish Chandra and how local character expansion. And this is a, it's a local expression which um, tells you how to, to write the character distribution of pi as a linear combination of certain distributions on the Lie algebra. So let me just, unpack that because it's a mouthful. So the character distribution, if you're not familiar with it, is just the natural extension of, of the notion of a character in the finite groups case. So usually um, you can take the trace of the representation and extend it linearly on the group algebra. Um, in the piadic case, you need to be a bit more careful here. We have infinite dimensional representations and these aren't finite groups. So we have an integral instead of a sum, but morally you should just think of it as the character. And like I said, it relates the character distribution to distributions on the Lie algebra. So we, we need to have an exponential function. And uh, in the Piatic case, this is only defined locally. Uh, it might not converge outside of a certain neighborhood of zero, but we fix these neighborhoods. It's a local character expansion, so that's okay. And once we have it, it's, it's defined in the bijection. And then what Harish Chandra and Howe's local character expansion states is that we can write for functions supported sufficiently close to the identity. So we fix some neighborhood of one. We can write um, the character distribution as a uniquely as a linear combination of Fourier transforms or nil-point orbital integrals. So it's not too important what these are. They are, if you have a nil-point orbit, you can attach a measure to it and it becomes a distribution by taking a function and restricting and then integrating over that measure. But the important thing is to every nil point orbit, we attach a complex number. So that's the important thing. And the way we get the wavefront set from the, the character distribution is uh, there's a natural partial ordering on the nil point orbits. So um, it, it's given by the closure ordering. So if you have a nil point orbit, you take the closure, it's a union of nil point orbits again, and this gives you a partial ordering. And it's important here that it's with respect to the topology induced by the field K and it's not the Zariski topology here. Um, but once you have this partial order, the wavefront set are just the maximal orbits which occur in the local character expansion. And by occur, I mean have non-zero coefficient. Okay, so this is it's a nice powerful invariant, so, um, but it, it's, it's very difficult to compute. And the most general result I know in this direction um, for piadic groups is, is known for GLN and for subquotients of the regular principle series. 
for split classical, classical groups. And this was proved by Monglein and Mosbjerg in, in 87. Um, and the reason why maybe more effort hasn't been spent on uh, this version of the, of the wavefront set is because um, inspired by the real setting, uh, there's a very nice phenomenon that occurs. So like I mentioned earlier in the talk, we have a notion of wavefront set for real groups as well. And there it's the same, same thing you get real point orbits over the real numbers. But what happens in the real case is all the real orbits, they lie in the same complex orbits. So when you base change, um, extend the scalars to the complex numbers, they all conjugate. So there's sort of one maximal com complex orbit, which they all lie in. So it's expected that the same thing happens here in the piadic case. Um, so if we have some piadic orbit, we can take the geometric orbit in which it lies in. You take the algebraic closure and you look at the geometric orbit there. Um, and the geometric orbits, again, have a partial order structure here given by the Zariski topology. And then we define the algebraic wavefront set just to be the coefficients that the maximal algebraic orbits which occur in the local character expansion. Um, so it's expected that this is much simpler to compute and somehow is a very good first approximation to the piadic wavefront set, which I described in the previous slide. And much more is known about the algebraic wavefront set. So in 2018 and 2000, um, in 2020, whilst Project computed this invariant for anti-tempered and tempered representations of pure inner twists of SI2M plus one. So it's a huge tour de force, um, very, very nice results. So this uh, this anti temper meaning that the Aubert dual is a uh, temper, right? Uh, the Aubert dual is tempered. That's exactly right. Yeah. And this so this is only for iso two plus one. Exactly. Yeah. So. I mean, um, what is the abstraction? I mean, to other. Classes? So his so his work um, is a tour de force in the combinatorics of the generalized Springer correspondence for iso two plus one. So um, understanding the Unipotent representations of uh, SO2 M plus one. There's a lot of pieces that need to fit together. I, I think I think by any means that whether this notion of anti-tempered or tempered uh -huh. also for other groups. Is there anti-tempered for yeah? Take or even orthogonal, I think what yeah. that means. So it's it's the dual of of tempered okay. representations. Yeah. That exists then. But yeah, the obstruction to why Walsh Bridget hasn't done it more generally is it's, it's very hard. Yeah. It's very hard. The combinatorics are very complicated. Okay. Um, so to summarize the results, so but in the anti-tempered case, he has a very nice description of the wavefront set in terms of, of um, the L parameters. Um, so for the unipotent representations, there's this listic classification um, in terms of L parameters where they're trivial on the inertia subgroup um, and uh, anti-tempered are, are unipotent in that sense. And what Walsh Bajay showed is that for split piadic groups, uh, well, so uh, I'll define some notation first. If you have a split piadic group um, and a representation which belongs to an L packet parameterized by this L parameter, we write O check of pi um, for this nil point orbit. Uh, and if it's unclear what this nil point orbit is, uh, if you restrict phi to this SL2 triple, um, if you recall, there's a classical theorem by Jacobson and Morozov that states that there's a bijection between conjugacy classes of homomorphisms of SL2 triples into a reductive group and the nil potent orbits of that reductive group. So under this Jacobson Morozov theorem, this O check pi is just the thing that corresponds to phi restricted to the, this SL2 triple. And then we're going to write AZ for the Aubert Zelovinsky dual. So Bayeng refers to this as the Aubert dual. Um, and we're going to write DBV for the Barbash Vogan dual. So this is a map from nil point orbits in the dual group to nil point orbits in the group itself. Um, and like I mentioned early in the talk, we can identify if they have the same root datum, then the partially ordered set of nil point orbits are the same. So we're going to view it as a map from here to the phone. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with the Barbash-Vogan dual in type A, 
you should just think of it as the transpose of a partition. So in type A, say GLN, the nil point orbits are parameterized by the Jordan normal form, which in turn are parameterized by partitions of N. And then the barbash Wurgen dual is just the transpose. Um, it's a little bit more complicated in general, but that's the idea to have in mind. So what Waspage showed is he showed that for anti-tempered representations, the algebraic wavefront set has this very nice interplay uh, with the local Langlands correspondence. So it's given by the barbash vogen dual of the nilpotent parameter of the Aubert dual of pi. So it's not too important exactly what this form is, but it's important somehow that there's some interplay there. Um, so for, for the recognition which are not anti-tempered, do we expect this? Um, so well, so on the next slide, we'll see that this isn't even true okay. for anti-tempered representations. So this is actually not even true for anti-tempered representations. So one of the early things I, I tried to do in my PhD was to, to generalize this result of Ospergé um, to exceptional groups where you have computers. Um, but what I found was that already in E7 and E8, you have anti-tempered representations where you don't have equality. So in general, you have an inequality but in E7 and E8, there are examples where it's strict. Um, so somehow the algebraic wavefront set is, is not sensitive enough to detect um, the interaction with the local Langlands correspondence. So it's too crude somehow. Um, and in my work, in my, in my DFIL, um, uh, I was sort of working on generalizing techniques by Barbash and Moy. Um, I introduced two new invariants called the unramified wavefront set and the canonical unramified wavefront set. And um, well, uh, this is the hopes is that this will rectify the situation. So these are, in a sense, refinements of the algebraic one. In terms of the sensitivity, they sit in between the piadic and the algebraic, uh, and they are somehow sensitive enough to pick out um, the interaction properly with the Langlands correspondence. So at the end of the talk, I'm going to state some um, a conjecture in how they relate and, and some evidence, um, some calculations to, to show that this indeed holds for some interesting cases. Um, so, so yeah, so, so the bulk of this talk will be in introducing these two new um, wavefront set invariants and, and how to calculate them. And sort of chronologically, in terms of research, the, the unramified one got discovered first, but it's the canonical unramified one, which really plays the starring role. But this is the more uh, accessible one. So I'm going to start by motivating it um, by looking at this. Um, and, and, and the definition is actually fairly straightforward. You just play the same game as the piadic and the algebraic case. So, so we just define the unramified wavefront set to be the maximal unramified orbits, which occur in, in the local character expansion. Um, but what really makes this interesting and worthwhile is that it connects to the wavefront set for finite groups of lead time. So if you remember at the start of the talk, I said there are wavefront sets for many different settings. And this is the one that connects to the finite groups of lead time case. So let me illustrate that um, now. Oops, that was a repeated slide. Um, so before we can do this, we need to introduce the Bruhatitz building of a piadic group. Um, it will feature in an essential way. So I'll give a brief introduction to what that is if you haven't seen that before. We're going to work in the absolutely simple, semi-simple case, and then we can ignore all these poly modifiers. And we should just think of these as simplish or complexes. But essentially, the Bruhatitz building is a simple. Oh, sorry, is there something in the chat? Okay. Is, is uh, sorry, I have a question in the chat. If W pi is the maximal orbit, uh, uh, so it's a no, no in general. So it's not the maximal orbit in general. Um, sorry, so to get back to, to this slide, so the Bruhatitz building is a simplicial complex you attach to the piadic group. And the piadic group acts on it by simplicial morphisms. And we're going to consider the split case for simplicity here. And the way the Bruhatitz building is formed is it consists of gluing together a bunch of apartments, one for every split maximal torus. So once you have your split maximal torus, 
take the co root, uh, co character lattice and tensor it with R, and you get a vector space. That's the apartment. And to make it a simplicial complex, um, you cut out the integral vanishings of the roots. So this is the vanishing of alpha two. This is alpha two equals one. This is alpha two equals to two. Um, and once you cut out your, your apartment in this way, you get a simplicial complex and, and the, the building is formed by bring, gluing these together. But for our intents and purposes, we just need to work with an apartment. So what do we need from these Bruhatitz buildings? Well, we're gonna need these so-called parahoric groups. Uh, and the way they're obtained is, well, you can take a facet of your building and you can take the stabilizer and that's gonna be defined over the ring of integers. Um, so you can sort of reduce mod P, take the special fiber and you get a reductive group defined over the residue field and, and you get an exact sequence here. Uh, and the kernel is, is the so-called pro unipotent radical. Um, but we're not interested in MC plus and PC plus. We're interested in the identity component of this reductive group. And we're interested in the pre-image, which we denote PC. And this is the so-called parahoric subgroup of G. Um, and this is the so-called reductive quotient. Uh, and it's not too important exactly how you obtain them, but we will have a look at a couple of examples because it's, it's helpful to know what they look like. So if we, again, look at our SP4 QP example, if we take our, our facet C to be the origin of this apartment, then the, the parahoric attached to the origin is just the integral points of, of SP4. So this is the apartment corresponding to the diagonal torus in SP4. And here the reductive quotient is, like I said, just reduction mod P is SP4 defined over FP instead. And this is just the kernel intersected with SP4. A slightly less trivial example, if we take C1 to be this vertex here, uh, the parahoric subgroup attached to this vertex is this mystical form. But what's interesting is that the reductive quotient is two copies of SP2 FP inside of FP4. SP4, sorry. Um, and if you look at the hyperplane arrangement going through C1, that's exactly a root system of type A1. And, and that's no coincidence. So that's the root system of SP2 cross SP2. Um, so this is a general thing. So if you take the simple roots for, for your root system and you form the extended Dinkin diagram, so the, the affine node is one minus the highest root. Uh, and you consider the fundamental alcove. So that's the vanishing. So that's the, that's the chamber cut out by these roots. So this is alpha two is equal to zero. This is alpha one equals to zero. And this is one minus the highest root equals to zero. Then if you label all the facets of this alcove um, by which extended simple roots vanish on them, you can determine what the root system of the reductive quotient is by just looking at the extended Dinkin diagram. So if we take this vertex here, the reductive quotient attached to this vertex here will have root system corresponding to the Dinkin diagram spanned by those labels. So that's at alpha one and alpha two. And that's the root system of type C2, which is what the root system of SP4 is. Um, but if we take this vertex, um, that has labels alpha not tilde and alpha two. Well, what's the root system spanned by these two vertices? It's alpha one plus alpha one. And that's exactly the root system of, of this vertex here. And as a final example, alpha two, that's just A1, and that's the root system of this thing here. Now you can notice it does, it's not sensitive to isogeny. It's, it's hard to tell the isogeny just based of, of the extended Dinkin diagram, but the root system is what really matters when you're looking at nil point orbits over an algebraically closed field. So this is enough information for us somehow. Um, so, so like I mentioned, we want to, we want to, we want to relate the unramified wavefront set with the wavefront set for finite groups of Lie type. So let me briefly tell you what that is. So uh, to a facet, you can attach a finite dimensional representation of this reductive quotient. So remember the reductive quotient was either SP4, FP or SP2 across SP2 in the cases above, we can attach a, a representation of that. And it's the fixed vectors of the pro-unipotent radical. So if you remember, this is PC mod UC. 
And since U C is normal, M C will then act on this. You get a representation in this manner. Um, and there's a notion of a wavefront set for finite groups of link type. Um, and sort of the construction, the definition is similar in spirit, but not, not quite identical. So again, we need to attach something to every nil point orbit of, of the finite group of lead type. And in the finite case, we, we attach a so-called generalized scale from Grave representation. So that's some representation. And it's not too important exactly what it is. But then the wavefront set of an irreducible representation is defined to be the maximal, unique maximal nil point orbit with the property that there is some f rational orbit in it. Which, which pairs non-zero with, with W. Um, uh, so yeah. again, it's not too important the exact definition, uh, but, but it is important that it exists. And for a reducible representation, we just define the wave from set to be the maximum over the reducible constituents. So nothing special there. Um, Sorry, so, so could you go back to, uh, so it's a unique one? Yeah. So this is so this is a result by by Lustig. Um, so it, you can actually compute. So there's a unique maximal orbit. So it wasn't known initially that this was so the case. This orbit is is uh, so the f fp bar or exactly. So oh. this o bar is a fp bar orbit, okay. oh. and these are fp orbits inside of it. So the little o's are. The non bold phase size so are I FP. See. So, in other words, the single, the singleton conjecture wave from set over a finite field is done. Yeah, there's a single okay. maximum one. And this was conjectured by Kawanaka um, yeah, yeah. and proved okay. by Listic. And there's a nice description in terms of the geometry of, of Listic's classification of irreducible representations. Okay, so, well, there's a notion. So, so okay, so we've got finite representations of finite groups of the type and we have chaotic representations and we want to relate them somehow um so we need a way of going between nil point orbits of the two so the way we do this is, is through lifting nil point orbits um so we're gonna we're gonna fix a facet c and we want to we want to find a way of lifting a nil point element from the reductive quotient and the procedure is fairly simple you just take the pre-image so there's a natural uh, surjection from the, the Lie algebra of the, of the parahoric to the Lie algebra of the reductive quotient. And you just look at all the nil point orbits which intersect this, this coset. And it's a fact that this is non-empty and it's a fact that there's a unique minimal element with respect to the closure ordering which intersects that. And that is defined to be the closure. Um, so this seems a bit abstract. So I'll just do a couple of examples to, to show you what, what happens. So if we take again, C not to be the origin, then the reductive quotient is SP4. And say we want to lift this nil point element. So this is the subregular um, 2 comma 2 orbit in SP4. Then the lift is, well, it looks the same, but the one here is an element of FP. The one here is an element of, of QP. So it's the orbit of this. Um, so that's fairly straightforward. Slightly less straightforward example is, is lifting a nil point orbit from this other vertex C1. So in this case, the, the reductive quotient was two copies of SP2. We're going to take the element that looks the same, but here this is now the principal orbit of this reductive quotient. And if you do this lifting procedure, you get a pi one inverse now. And well, they have the same Jordan decomposition so they lie in the same geometric orbit, but um, they're not conjugate under the action of SP4 QP. So you get a genuinely different nil point orbit when you lift this element, but from an element of, of this reductive quotient instead. Um, but the key point is, is there's a way of lifting nil point orbits. Um, and if you have two elements which are in the same orbit, then they lift to the same orbit. Uh, so we can view the lifting so, so, map. Sorry, so the original orbit and the lifting orbit, they have the same geometric orbit in any case, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's right. Um, so in the split case, you can make that comparison exactly. Um, so you take a, well, so you get a map from pairs C comma O 
So C is a facet and O is some nil point element of the reductive quotient. So you can you can lift in this way. And it's a surjective map. So you get every orbit in this way. And this was proven by Barbash and Moy in 97 and then vastly generalized by De Becker um, in 2002. Um, but this seems to give a so, so in the in the finite case, there was also this notion of the geometric maximal orbit and then the f rational orbits inside of it. Um, so somehow a rational and a, an algebraic wave from set there as well. So this hints at a connection between the piadic wave from set and, and the f rational case. But the problem is there's no intrinsic notion of order preserving this in this lifting procedure. So since we're over the finite field, there's no really topology on the FP points because they're a finite set. And the Zariski topology doesn't give anything interesting. Um, but recall, we also had this geometric orbit, which came uh, with the wave front set in the finite case. Um, and there you do have a, an interesting Zariski topology. And what you lift to it are then unramified orbits. So this is why unramified orbits come into the picture. So we have an entirely analogous lifting procedure for capital F rational orbits to capital K rational orbits. So you have some facet of the building and you have some orbit in the reductive quotient and you can, you can lift it. But crucially in this case, if you have uh, an orbit which is strictly smaller than the other, then the lifts will also be strictly smaller than the other. So that's something we didn't really have in the finite, in the piadic case. Um, and then if we just define the so-called local wavefront set operators, so for a facet of the building, you just lift the wavefront set for the finite representation for the, the reductive quotient, then the key result relating the unramified wavefront set to the, the local wavefront set operators is you can just compute it locally and then take the maximum over. So you can just fix the chamber and then you only need to do this computation for finitely many things. You just take every facet of your chamber, you calculate the, the wave from set for the finite representation, and you lift and you take the maximum. Um, so this is why the unramified wave from set comes into the picture and, and what really makes it accessible. Because like I mentioned, the piadic one is um, it's very hard, hard to, get a, to get a grasp on, but this allows us to really calculate this in practice um so, so uh, you're saying what, so uh, if, if consider this capital k then uh, it preserves the order this sorry lift. so if you consider this capital k then the order is preserved and the lifting exactly so otherwise if we consider not the amplified maximum amplified then may not be preserved this uh, order. lifting uh, so so in the in the capital case, case in the maximum amount of fight, it is always preserved. In the little k, there is no order on, on the, there's no natural intrinsic ordering on the nil point orbits. So there's nothing to lift. So it's just a lack of structure really. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So uh, we even have a more, so if, if pi is Iwahori spherical, it's actually very easy to compute what these local wave from set operators are. So, each one of these finite representations, um, they give you representations of, of the Oahoi Heke algebra of, of that uh, reductive quotient. And there's a Q goes to one operation. So you can obtain representations of the VAR group by that deformation. Um, and then computing the local wavefront set operator then is just an exercise in Springer supports really. So you just take this unique special representation in the same two-sided cell as E tensor sign and you take the spring of support. So it's not too important if you're not familiar with these, these terms, but the point is just you can reduce it to a question about representations of the vial group. Um, and then once you do that, then computing the wave front set is, is just um, taking the maximum over, over these orbits that you obtain in this manner. So, so really going back to this, calculating this is straightforward. Um, the only remaining obstacle is uh, are, are the two following is, do we have a nice description of the unramified orbits, in particular one which allows us to figure out the geometric orbit and to what are the closure relations? Because we want to calculate this maximum. Um, and, and one of the first results of my thesis was a 
was the answer to these first two questions here. Um, and it turns out there is a very nice description of the unramified orbit for, for a reductive group, and, and it's entirely described by the split reductive group with the same root datum, but over C. So we can just work over the complex numbers. Um, and the way it works is, is it's parameterized by these pairs, O comma C. So O here is some nil point orbit of, of GC, and C is some conjugacy class of the G equivariant fundamental group of O. So by that, I mean the component group of the centralizer, of some element of, of O. Um, and, and what I found is there's a canonical bijection uh, between unramified orbits and this set here. So notably, this set has been used to, to also parameterize um, F, uh, so um, FP nil point orbits in the finite groups of the type case, but that's a cohomological construction. This is not a cohomological construction, it's a constructive bijection. Um, and it is canonical. And in particular, it makes this square commute. So remember at the start of the talk, I said you can identify the nil point orbits if you're of an algebraically closed field. Um, the, the partially ordered set doesn't really matter. Uh, it doesn't really depend on the base field. And once you make this identification, it is compatible with this uh, bijection here. So a pair, the first entry is, is now limit here. So you have a projection and um, the square commutes essentially. So this really answers the first question of like, how do we understand the unramified orbits? Um, but it doesn't answer the question of how do we understand the, the closure orderings, which is also very important. Um, but interestingly, it, it actually allows us to circumvent that issue. So understanding the closure orderings is actually quite a difficult, difficult problem to solve. Um, but what's quite nice is uh, this, so this left-hand set, ds of g, um, I call them dual Springer parameters. It's not a great name because it's not Springer parameters on a dual group. It's dual in the sense of conjugacy classes. So if anyone has a better name, feel free to let me know at the end of the talk. Um, but this, these dual Springer parameters, they're well studied. So particularly by Summers and Achar, um, they've studied these parameters extensively. Whereas the unramified nil point orbits aren't really that much studied in the literature because capital K is not a complete field. The geometry is a bit unpleasant. Um, but uh, what's nice is that these dual Springer parameters, there's, there's a map defined by Summers in 2001 uh, which goes from these dual Springer parameters to nil point orbits of the dual group. Um, what this allows us to do is it actually allows us to, to define a new pre order on the unramified nil point orbits. So Achar used this map in 2003 to, to define a pre order on this set. And the easiest way to understand it is it's the finest pre order, which makes the duality map order reversing and the projection map orbit order preserving. Uh, so in symbols, if you have a pair O comma C and O comma O prime comma C prime, um, we say one is less than or equal to the other if DS flips it and, and the first factors are preserved. Um, now, what's very interesting is that this is not an isomorphism of pre-orders. So the, the closure orderings on the unramified set are a partial order, but the Achara's pre-order on, on these dual Springer parameters are not. Um, you can have, it's not anti-symmetric. In other words, you can have X less than Y and Y less than X, but they could be different. Um, but what is important is that the pre-order on, on the dual Springer parameters is much easier to understand than this. So Achara has uh, done a lot of work on this. And, and in particular, so this issue of the fact that it's a pre-order rather than a partial order is not really a problem as well because the equivalence classes are very well understood. So in particular, um, you can describe them as follows. We let ds bar denote all the pairs O comma C where O is a nil point orbit and C is a conjugacy class in, in Listic's canonical quotient. So you might have only encountered the state's canonical quotient in the context of special orbits for adjoint groups. But in this 2001 papers by Summers, 
he extends the definition to all orbits and all isogenies. And this is the definition of Listic's canonical quotient we're using here. Um, then the equivalence classes of this pre-order are just the pre-image under, it's just the fibers of this natural map here. So canonical quotient is just the quotient of this group. Um, and if you have a conjugacy class here, you can take the image inside of the quotient and that gives you a conjugacy class in the quotient. So it's a very natural map here. And then this is the canonical isomorphism I described in the previous slide. And the fibers of this, of this map are exactly the equivalence classes. So, so yeah, so this, this really gives us a, a new partial order or, or pre-order on, on the unramified orbits, which weren't accessible before just by topological considerations. Um, and, and this, this characterization has a couple of other added benefits. So in this paper by Achar, he defines these duality maps, DA going from DS bar to DS bar for the dual group. And they extend Summer's duality in a very natural sense so to make this diagram commute. Um, essentially, they're, they're more sensitive than, than the Summers and barbash vogan duality maps. Um, but this will come in very handy when we compute the wavefront set because we will be interested in perverse sheaves on G check. And what this, sum, uh, this duality map will do is it will give us information about equivalence classes of unramified orbits on the left-hand side. Um, so it comes with this added benefit. So, so you can, so we have a new pre-order on the unramified wave, on the unramified orbits. And the natural thing to do is to play the same game as before. And conjecturally, we can do that. We just define the canonical unramified wavefront set to be the maximal unramified orbits with respect to this new pre-order. And here, maximality in a pre-order just means uh, if x is less than y, then y is less than x. Um, but for all the technicalities to work out, the definition is a little bit more difficult than that. But assuming some fairly fundamental conjectures hold, um, this is indeed exactly what it is. So this is what we should think of it as being just for the purpose of this talk. Um, but crucially, what is a theorem and not a conjecture is that uh, everything I said about the unramified wavefront set just holds in this case here. So you can compute it in terms of these local operators and the algebraic wavefront set can be determined from the unramified one. So uh, it's very hands-on. So to give an example on how to compute the, um, these wavefront sets, uh, we're going to do them for a special class of representations called spherical Arthur representations. And these are um, spherical representations or unramified representations, if you will, uh, which are particularly important for automorphic forms. So um, Bying recently published a preprint um, where he bounds the, the degenerate Whitaker Fourier coefficients um, by reducing to, to this the case of these spherical Arthur representations. And what these spherical Arthur representations are, um, there's one attached to every nil point orbit of the dual group. And well, they're, they're naturally spherical representations are described by the Sataki parameter and Sataki parameter of these representations are one half H check where H check is the neutral component for this nil point orbit. And in terms of Arthur packets, um, this is the representation which is trivial on the Vedelin group and whose SL2 corresponds to O check under this Jacobson Morozov. So it corresponds to the trivial representation in that packet. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'll I will demonstrate quickly uh, how to use these methods for um, to compute the unramified canonical unramified wavefront set here. So we're going to fix a spherical Arthur representation corresponding to to a nil point orbit I check and we fix some element of this nil point orbit. Um, and the extended vial group naturally acts on the apartments of these, of, of, the, of the building. And we let dot just denote the projection map here. Um, and we fix our apartment in our chamber like before. And, 
And like I mentioned earlier, to compute the local wavefront set operators, we just need to know the deformation as Q goes to one of these finite representations for C, a facet of, of this fixed chamber here. Um, and it's a, it's a theorem by Mark Reeder and, and Listic, um, just that uh, the structure of this representation here is given by, so you take the total cohomology of the Springer fiber at N, and you take the trivial isotypical component. This is naturally a representation of the Val group, W. Um, and then the, the Val group of the, the reductive quotient is naturally a subgroup of the Val group under this projection map here. And uh, under that identification, that gives you the structure of this, of this module here. Um, and we're interested in, in computing the contribution of E uh, to the local wavefront set. Uh, and to do that, we just need to know the multiplicity inside of, of this representation. And that's given, so it's not too important exactly what this expression is, but this is um, the multiplicity sheaf uh, for E inside of here. And crucially, E occurs in this representation with multiplicity given by multiplicity of the trivial local system of this perverse sheaf restricted to O check. So um, in particular, it's bounded above by the total cohomology of the stock of this sheaf. Um, what's very nice is, is that suppose E occurs in the local wave from set, and if you lift the nil point orbit up, the perverse sheaf has support contained exactly in the closure of, of the Summer's dual of, of this lift. Um, so what that means is that uh, R of E, this contribution to the local wavefront set operator, only occurs if O check is less than or equal to this Summer's dual. Um, and so we have the following diagram. So this is the square from earlier where we identify the Springer dual Springer parameters with the unramified orbits. Um, this square commutes, but this triangle might not necessarily commute. We have that projection is always less than going around this way here. Um, basically, if you, if you string together uh, the various uh, statements I've written down, what we get is that uh, the geometric orbit, so if O lies in the in this local wavefront set operator, it must be bounded above by the barbash vergen dual of the of O check. Um, and, and if you sort of look more into the details of it, you actually get this stronger condition. But it, the upshot is basically that you get inequalities here. Um, and with some more careful analysis of these perverse sheaves, I introduced, I include this mostly to give a flavor for what these computations look like. But the upshot is, is essentially that you can get these equalities. So the wavefront set of, of the spherical ith representation is given in terms of, of this dual, and the canonical and ramified wavefront set is, is given in terms of this a char dual of O check one, and then the fibers of this. Um, and, and this sort of agrees with uh, what happened for, for Wasperger in his anti tempered case. But what's crucial, um, so, sorry, so to answer a question earlier from the chat, uh, this shows that indeed the wavefront set of an unramified thing is not always the maximum. So, I mean, you can have this be any special orbit inside of uh, the partially ordered set of or nil point orbits. So you can get a lot of different answers here. Um, but the crucial thing is that if you apply the Summers duality to, to the canonical unramified wavefront set, you can recover the parameter here. And, and this is conjecturally what will happen, what I think happens in, in general. So if you have an admissible representation of G, the conjecture is that the canonical unramified wavefront set consists of a equivalence class under Isachar equivalence. And the relation is that the sum is dual of the canonical unramified wavefront set is equal to the nil potent parameter of the Aubert rule of, of pi. Um, and this would explain exactly what I explained at the beginning of the talk. So if you recall, whilst Paget had proven some other equality for SO2 n plus one, which didn't hold for E7 and E8, 
And the reason is, well, one always has the following inequality. So this is just abstract nonsense. Um, if you look at the definition of a car duality, this is an inequality that just follows from the properties of, of this duality map. Um, but the fact that, so whilst Piaget's statement was that this is always equal to this, um, and the fact that this holds for SO2m plus one is, is a consequence of just certain rigidities in the nil point orbits of, of SO2m plus one. And if you look at E7 and E8, these rigidities don't exist anymore. And so you can have strict inequalities occurring. So somehow this, this identity by wasp for SO2m plus one is really somehow a shadow of, of, of this particular equality, which, which is expected to hold in general. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is what I've been working on uh, recently. The hope is to prove this, that this holds um, more generally um, for, for all unipotent representations in the sense of listic. So in terms of L parameter, that corresponds to fees, which are trivial on the inertia subgroup. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so that would be um, the... the the connection with the local Langlands correspondence. So, yeah. uh, any questions? All right, any questions? Bruno, you're muted. I'm also directing it to you, both of you. I mean, Boeing and uh, Emil. Does this say anything about this uh, Jiang's conjecture? I mean, in the in the setting of, I mean, the global automorphic forms, I mean, for the unramified pieces there, I mean, I'm just curious to see, I mean, this uh, this inequality 34 that you have, uh -huh. that's a barbash Rogan duality of this uh, Ober, I mean, Zelvinsky or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and does it say anything about the conjecture? That you know Jiang's conjecture and could you remind me of what this conjecture is? I mean, what is the ah, okay. the, maybe by why, why don't you help? <laughs> the, yeah, so does it say anything? Oh, um, well, first, uh, let me see. Um, I mean, there is this barash Wogan duality there that is, a, is an upper bound. Yeah, so so first, uh, 34 is not proved yet, right? Because you conjecture this equality, right? Yeah, so actually I can prove 34 for all Iwahori spheres. Yeah. The cool representations I have, but um, I can prove 34 for all unramified representations. Could you repeat? So, so 34 holds for all unramified representations. Unramified. For yeah. oh, armified, you mean not not just the spherical one, not not so, just so, the yes, spherical, spherical slash unramified. Same. Okay, thing. so so therefore only proved the uh, for the you see the armified condition if the other parameter trivial on within group, right? Um, what do you mean? It, it's trivial on the SL two and the inertia subgroup. Uh, yeah, the on within group, right? So. That's, that's what that's what you showed, right? The RMFI, the spherical other yeah. so the other parameter is trivial on the way dealing group. Oh, the other parameter, yes. Well, it's it's like unipotent representations in some sense, because it's not trivial on the other SL2. Yeah, mm -hmm. so is that right? That's that's what you show, right, Emil? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's not so in other words, 34 is not proof for all RMFI representations. Yeah. No, no. Only yeah. the ones that are Iwahori spherical. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so freedom. So, if we know thirty-four for all unified representation, then I mean, Jan's conjecture, the the bound, it can be bounded. Yeah, that will, it will give you the upper bound, right? Yeah, good upper bound. Yes. But so, since 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 the MLR cardinal result is for the is the other parameter, right? So only trivial on the weighting group. So that that just part of the unified representation. Yeah. Yeah. So so. Uh, so my work with DeHua is so uh, we can reduce. Uh, we want the bound. We're going to give it the upper bound. So we we'll reduce to the to the case proved by ML. 
So oh. hence, okay, that, that's the kind of a global look. And global. Yeah, 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 something. So, um, so it's it will be very interesting if we can if study four can prove like for all amplifier presentation. Yeah, yeah I, I think yeah. So sorry, sorry this, so in in my paper I, I prove it for the ones which are trivial on the Vedelin group, um, but in unpublished work. Um, do have results which would show you this inequality for all unramified representations, but it relies on some results which Listic have published but hasn't published a proof for. So and, I'd like and to. Just, and not just the unipotent one, right? I mean, for. Yes, yeah, so any such Okay, first. I see. So, yes, yeah. you do have the result for uh, 34 for all unramified representation. Yeah, but it, um, yeah, so the, okay. the problem is it relies on the results of sure, Listic. Sure. Okay. Uh, which uh, he hasn't published a proof. Okay. So. Okay. So, yeah. But is so, he going to publish a proof? Or, I mean, is Lustig going um, to... So my supervisor contacted him and he said he would like to publish a proof. Um, but this paper came out. So this is Cuspital Local Systems, which came out, I don't know, in the 90s, 80s. I'm not sure. It's a long time ago now. So. And he hasn't published it since then? He hasn't published an oh, explicit God. proof. So, uh, I mean, I hope to... I, I'm interested in for, for my own sake to, to see if I can fill the gaps myself. Um, and hopefully that would be the you next one. You can talk to Lustig and see if he will let you do that. Just go on yourself. You can talk to Lustig and see if you can do that. I mean, it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I should, I should talk to him about it. Yeah. And if he has any advice as well. So, I mean, you can, I mean, you can add your contribution and make it join, join paper with him. That's, I thought it'd be amazing, yeah. Yeah, if he's interested, that's uh, yeah, no, that would be fantastic. Um, I should get in touch with him about that. Yeah, and this uh, Archer's paper is the one, the two thousand and three paper, right? That the duality you're talking about. They, he didn't exactly. do anything recently, right? These are yeah, these are old papers. So Achar and Summers duality were published in two thousand and three and two thousand and one, respectively. So these are. Um, these are all papers, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. But 34, you're expecting this is true for any admission? I expect it to be true. It's true for all the Ohoi spherical. I expect, yeah, I expect it to be true for any unipotent representation. Yeah, so it would be a consequence of 33. So I expect, I hope 33 holds always. 33 holds always, then 34 holds always. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, uh, so from the, uh, I mean, so, so uh, compared to your, the per, your perpend, right? So, yes, yes, you have the uh, amplified condition we found set. So, yeah, mm -hmm. depend on some result of stick. So, besides that, so uh, any other technical improvement there or? Yeah, so um, I mean, I'm working now on a joint project with Dan Chibutaru and, and Lucas Mason Brown on on doing it for for real infinitesimal characters. So uh, you have unipotent in the sense of listic, so trivial on the inertia subgroup, but where the image of the semi-simple element is real. We're sort of working on um, looking at special cases of that and and defining these notions of special unipotent representations. So there's a notion of special unipotent representations in, in real groups uh, defined by Adam, Barbush, and Bogin, and sort of using this canonical unramified wavefront set to also define um, special unipotent for, for pianic groups and in the process computing the, the, this invariant for, for particular real um, infinitesimal characters. And, and you would know them for, for classical groups, for example, the one with the, I mean, with this thing that you generalize from the real groups to periodic groups. Do you know, I mean, what are they in the classical groups with, with the, all the work of Arthur and, uh, would they be, I mean, how much, how many are, I mean, how many of the unipotent representations would be like that? Uh, do you mean for which we but, know the algebraic yeah, wave? But is it, I mean, it doesn't cover the whole thing, right? It covers, I mean, some of the unipotent yeah. representations. 
yeah, no, it covers a small subset. And the most general work I know is the one by Wasp Bajay for SO2 and plus one. But I, I, I hope this will hold for, for all for all unipotent in the sense of holistic. Um, so okay. I'm not sure I maybe understood the question. Did, does that answer it? I mean, I'm trying to understand what's going on. So that's the, I'm just wondering these, ex, these extensions that you talked about. Uh -huh. the real to piatic because I mean, there's all those work done on the uh, unipotent over for real groups. And now if you extend it here, I wonder uh, how much it covers and how many, what in, what percentage of the representation? I mean, I don't mean to give me the number, but is it uh, small? Is it, I mean, almost, is it, what is the, there will be a lot of representations which would not be like that, right? But Oh, like, like 33 or like special unipotent? Uh, like 33, for example. Um, yeah, so, the conjecture now is a bit speculative. The hope is that this will always hold, but maybe a, for now it's representations of, of unipotent reduction. I haven't really looked at examples um, outside of representations of unipotent reduction. Um, but so far I haven't seen any evidence against, against this holding in full generality. Okay. Yeah. Um, I do have one question. For 34, you said you, you have some unpublished lessons. Okay, this is true for amplify representation, right? Yeah. So is it equal always? Uh, mm. No, so I only have a proof of the bound. So I, I don't have a proof of, of equality. So the bound is actually fairly straightforward to get. So you can describe these multiplicity sheaves in terms of character sheaves on the complex dual group. And then this bound is a consequence of this notion of unipotent support of character sheaves. So okay. the state defines uh, unipotent support and, and then this inequality just is a simple consequence of that. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's next. Let's talk. Thank you. Nice talk. <laughs>